So Imran is uh, out of the, the Bay Area, uh, where he was at Berkeley and at Stanford, and uh, I think has been fortunate to have some really strong mentors in this, feed, in this field. Uh, one of them we'll hear from later. You had BJ, uh, as well as one of your uh, early mentors, uh, and Daphne uh, Kolo that we'll hear from later. After that, uh, you went on and you spent some time at uh, Freenome uh, and at uh, Council and, uh, and had, I think, big impacts there. Now you moved on to Recursion. And uh, I, I think seeing what's happening at Recursion is, I think, truly exciting. And as you're heading data science is there, and I'm really looking forward to what you have to share with us in the space. So welcome to the stage. And please help me and welcome. In. Thanks, Klaus, and thanks everyone for, for having me this morning. Um, as, as Klaus introduced, uh, I'm Imran. I'm VP of Data Science at, at Recursion. Uh, and today what I'd like to do is talk to you about um, the ways in which we use uh, machine learning and AI to build our mapping and navigating platform um, with, our, with our genome scale maps. Now, this concept of maps of biology is extremely abstract, so I'll explain it by analogy. Um, Imagine if you had a, a single tool available on your computer that could show you the entire landscape of routes to, a, to, to the same destination. So let's say that you were planning, like me, your trip yesterday from, from Heathrow into, into central London, and you could see in one screen uh, your choices of taking different trains, different roads, whether highways or, or, or local roads and so on, um, in one tool, rather than having to look up separately a train timetable and a, and a tube map and a, and, a, and a road map. Imagine if that same tool could also show you ways to get around roadblocks, so that once you got into central London, and you see, oh no, this road is closed. Well, I can just go around it, and I can still make it to the, to the same place that I'm, that I'm trying to reach. And finally, imagine that you also had a tool that could show you the relationships among all of these options, so that you could make an intelligent choice, for example, between taking the tube or taking the car, depending on the traffic and the cost at a particular time of day. Now, of course, what I've shown here is just screenshots from, from Google Maps while I was trying to figure out how to get from the, from the airport to here. But imagine if we had similar tools to be able to do that in biology. How would we do that? Well, what if we took cells and we individually knocked out each gene in the genome and individually dosed hundreds of thousands of small molecules at multiple concentrations and then took some pictures and then shoved it into the deep learning? What would come out? What would come out is something that looks like what we call a recursion, maps of biology. And I'll show you as an introduction a few of the things that this technology enables for our understanding of biology, our understanding of chemistry, and then tell you a little bit more about how we go about doing them. So for example, in terms of understanding the, land, the, the, the network of possibilities or the landscape of possibilities around disease, um, what I'm showing you here are some data coming out of the arrayed CRISPR knockouts of 17,000 genes that we've built um, in our maps of biology. We've individually knocked out each one of those genes using multiple CRISPR guides to, to control for, for off-target effects. Uh, and we can identify which gene knockouts produce similar phenotypes in the cell. So what I'm showing here on this slide is if we started with uh, all genes associated with breast cancer in the human phenotype ontology, and then asked our maps, show us which of these genes appear to have statistically significant connections between each other or have significantly similar phenotypes, uh, and then drew edges between those genes. What we would get is a reconstruction of decades of research in breast cancer conducted as a single query in our database. Right over here, you see that the BRCA complex immediately jumps out as a, as a tightly connected cluster. You see BRCA1, BRCA2, uh, RAD51, BARD1, PALB2, and so on. Up here, you also see um, a mitogen-associated cluster. You see the RAS-RAF pathway, HER2, uh, and PI3 kinase-associated genes. Now, one thing that's important to realize here is that there is no prior training on literature data. This is purely de novo reconstruction from experiments that we've, that, that we've conducted, purely based on the, on the uh, AI-enabled phenotypes that, that, that we get from the cells. So there is no history, the, the model didn't know, for example, that there is a gene called BRCA1 or a gene called BRCA2. It sees something called rec gRNA, whatever the idea is. And it's simply those phenotypes that, that, that actually come through and draw these connections. 
You can also find ways around particular roadblocks that you see. So this is data actually from one of our active programs called Target Gamma that, that we disclosed information about about a month ago. So um, in uh, homologous recombination proficient cancers, um, folks are interested in CDK12 as a, as a potential target for treatment. But a big challenge with drugging CDK12 is that structurally it's extremely similar to another cyclin-dependent kinase, CDK13. Uh, and it's believed that that, that creates a, a very challenging profile because there's CDK13-mediated toxicity uh, that's, that's dose-limiting and, and potentially treatment-killing for, for CDK12 treatments. Um, what we find in our maps is, is two things. One, we see that CDK12 and CDK13 are extremely dissimilar in their cellular phenotypes. So we have confidence that the toxicity that's observed in CDK12, CDK13 treatments is likely due to that CDK13 off-target effect. It's not an on-target toxicity. Furthermore, we see that there's actually a great similarity in phenotype between CDK12 and, and the knockout of another gene, RBM39, suggesting that there's a different way to get at this biological network and achieve the effects of CDK12 inhibition by going after a different target entirely. And finally, what we see is that there is a compound in our library that in a dose-responsive fashion phenomimics the loss of RBM39 and the loss of CDK12, and this potentially gives us a way around this biological and chemical selectivity roadblock between CDK12 and CDK13. Finally, we can see the landscape of possibilities and the landscape of activities that a, that a particular compound might have. So this is actually something that if you're on the Wi-Fi here uh, or if you're, or if you're uh, joining from online, you can go to rxrx3.rxrx.ai and play around with this yourself. Um, what recursion maps of biology allow us to do is to, see the, is to see the inferred effects of a particular compound against all possible gene knockouts, all possible targets in a single assay, rather than having to run individual assays for every one of these compounds. The data that I'm showing here, uh, like I said, that, that, that you can see online or our tool Molrec, uh, is from profiling of the proteasome inhibitor bortezomib. And what we see is a concentration response curve showing that bortezomib is indeed extremely potent uh, and shows similarity to, to the loss of, of the beta and alpha subunits of, of the proteasome. It also shows similarity to this other gene, SNRPD3, that isn't obviously proteasome associated, but it turns out that this is a splicing factor that controls splicing of proteasomal proteins. And so we're seeing exactly those relationships. We're also seeing similarity in dose responsiveness against a pair of masked targets um, that, that, we have in, that we have internally, but which we haven't given away all the details for. So how do we build the technology? How do we use machine learning and deep learning to build these maps and achieve these results um, that, 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 that we do? Um, let's talk a little bit about building image-based maps using machine learning and AI. So this, this talk will be a little bit technical, but I promise it won't get too deep. The fundamental property of maps that you need to understand is similarity. What at its root we are looking to define is how similar or dissimilar two different cellular phenotypes are from each other. Now, that's a very squishy concept. The most intuitive way to understand it is in a perturbative context. Let's say that you have a cell at a baseline state or a wild type state. Two perturbations to that state are similar if they make the cell do the same thing, they're dissimilar if they make the cell do different things. They're opposite if they make the cell do opposite things. Or if, for example, you could co-treat a cell with both of them and have it return back to that wild type state. To give you some biological intuition, let's consider a particular biological context that's been well described for decades. That's a tumor suppressor complex and, and, and mTOR signaling. Uh, two proteins, Tuberin and Hamartin, coded for the genes TSC1 and 2, form a protein complex that together act as negative regulators of, of mTOR signaling. So what we would expect in a map to recapitulate this is the following. We would expect that deletion of TSC1 or deletion of TSC2 should look extremely similar to one another because both of them function together in the same complex. Losing either one of them should lose a negative regulatory effect. Similarly, we should expect that loss of either one of those should look opposite to the loss of mTOR because this complex together acts as a negative regulator of mTOR. So if you lose this, mTOR goes up. If you delete mTOR, that looks like not losing these. And indeed, this is data from our maps showing exactly that. We see that TSC1 and TSC2 are extremely closely related, and critically, they are negatively connected to, to, to mTOR. 
And so this is the notion of similarity that, that, that we're interested in. Now, obviously, you could define individual assays for individual pathways, but that would be extremely hard to scale. Our interest in, in recursion is to build a map of all of cellular biology. So we can't just build single assays for every single one of these pathways, especially pathways that are not already deeply characterized. I would argue that the properties that you need for a universal assay in order to build these data are three characteristics. First, breadth of coverage. We'd like to know which perturbations actually produce a response in a particular assay. So for example, if the only readout that you have is cellular proliferation, that might work if you have grossly proliferative or cytotoxic readouts, but there's an enormous amount of detail that you would be missing about what's going on underneath the hood of that perturbation. There are also a number of perturbations that simply aren't going to lead to that kind of response, and so you'll need to get more data than that. Two, we would like to standardize these readouts. For example, traditional high-content imaging would require a different antibody for every protein that, that, that you want to track. That's an enormous amount of work invested in antibody qualification, in, in imaging setup, and so on. We would like to make sure that you don't have to custom engineer your assay for every different condition that you'd like to map. And finally, and potentially most critically, is computability. How easily we can actually analyze and integrate the data from every perturbation. And this comes in two stages. One, we can imagine that you know, there may be things that a human could look at and, and, could, and, could tease apart and, and could tease apart the differences. The challenge is that humans don't scale, especially not if you're trying to do pairwise comparisons of 20,000 genes against 20,000 genes and hundreds of thousands of compounds. So we need to be able to take these, these elements and actually put them on a computer. But beyond that, one of, the, one of the goals of these assays and one of the goals of our algorithms is to find differences that humans may not themselves be able to find. And so it's critical that whatever data modalities we use be computable. Now, if you were like me you know, three to five years ago, you were probably 10 pounds lighter and had a much, far fewer gray hairs. Um, but in more seriousness, if you were like me 10 years ago or five years ago, you would think, well, the, the obvious answer to this question is sequencing. Um, you, could do you could do other molecular omics like microarrays. You could do RNA-seq. Uh, in some cases, you might be able to do DNA-seq or do epigenetics. Um, these assays are broad. We would expect that a lot of perturbations would produce transcriptomic responses. They're highly standardized. You perturb your cells however you want and read them out in a common fashion. And they're intrinsically computable because the data that you get out at the end is counts over genes or counts over genomic regions. And computers are quite good at handling that sort of tabular data. The challenge is that molecular omics are quite expensive. You're talking about dollars, tens of dollars, hundreds of dollars per sample. And if you want to be able to run millions of samples per week, which is a scale that recursion labs operate at, that's simply not the kind of scale that, that, that you can run at. So the interesting way that recursion addresses this challenge is through imaging. Cellular morphology is an extremely interesting and broad data readout. It's actually downstream of RNA transcription, downstream of protein translation, downstream of protein activity. And as a consequence, in some cases, it can observe effects that molecular assays may not. You can actually see changes in cellular morphology even when there's no underlying change in, in cellular transcription. And as a consequence, you can see an extremely broad range of changes. Images can be extremely cheap. All you have to do is stain your cells, take a picture of them. That doesn't require complicated cycling and, and molecular reagents. And so at Recursion, we use a highly standardized assay that we call phenomics um, that's related to the cell painting assay developed by our scientific advisor, Ann Carpenter of the Broad. And this assay stains six common cellular substructures, nucleic acids, Golgi, ER, plasma membranes, and so on. And what I'm showing here on this slide is an example where disease model X is caused by knockdown of a particular gene, healthy control is a healthy control, uh, and you can actually see by eye the morphology of these cells change as you increase concentrations of a, of a therapeutic compound on the cells. Now, what I've shown here is an example where you can see by eye the changes in cellular morphology from elongated to round as we, as we bring back to healthy. Um, but in fact, the core of our work functions on phenotypes that are not so easily distinguishable by eye, or where the distinctions that you might see by eye are actually misleading. They may be due to batch effect, and there are underlying effects that the algorithms can tease out. Now, these assays, it turns out, capture super broad swaths of biology. 
It may not be obvious that by staining these six common cellular substructures, you can pull out a, a ton of information, but it turns out that this is an unexpectedly powerful standard assay. We can sensitively detect and quantify in dose response across hundreds or even thousands of mechanisms. This is a fairly old figure, actually. Sever even several years ago, we were able to show that in our assay, we could uh, sensitively cluster many, many different kinds of, of biology, even things that on surface may look like they're having the same anti-cancer, anti-proliferate effects into their unique mechanisms of action. And so what we have here is an assay that's cheap and scalable, a cheap that's standardizable, and a cheap that's broad. But how do we actually compute on them? Computability has historically been a challenge for, for imaging data, right? Unlike gene expression data, which is naturally tabular, um, images come naturally as pixels. Uh, and I think that the challenge was, was well summed up in this, in this XKCD comic from a few years ago. Checking whether or not you're in a national, app, a national park, that's an easy lookup in a table based on, based on coordinates. But telling whether or not a picture is of a bird, well, five, 10 years ago, that was a hard problem. Um, of course, as we're all aware, uh, this is an XKCD that, that unfortunately has not actually stood the test of time. And today, there are off-the-shelf models that will tell you whether or not uh, a bird is actually present in the picture. And similarly for recursion, we actually apply deep learning in order to take these cellular images and make them computable. The goal of our, of our AI and ML work is to turn unstructured images into computable data. And in particular, what we do is we custom train deep learning algorithms at recursion based on our internal experimentation on a range of different objectives, uh, classifying against batch effect, classifying similar perturbations together, and, and so on. And in doing so, are able to extract meaningful biological representations, hundreds or thousands of dimensions that characterize the biological meaning of a particular image, and thus are able to build the maps that I showed you on those, on those earlier slides. A key advantage of these models is that they can accelerate development across cell types. A couple of years ago, we were able to take these models, move them from the common cell types that we used into a new cell type in order to do testing of both antiviral and anti-cytokine storm agents uh, for, for COVID-19. Uh, we pre-printed that data. In, we ran those assays in March and April of 2020, pre-printed the results in April and May, I want to say, of 2020. Uh, and two and a half years down the line, eight out of the nine predictions that we made that actually made it to clinical trials, we predicted correctly. Um, so one of the huge advantages of these algorithms is because they learn on data, uh, they can very rapidly accelerate the development of new therapeutics and new models uh, in an emergent context. Now, one challenge that folks raise with respect to these deep learning models is that the features may not be directly interpretable. I couldn't tell you exactly what dimension three is telling me about, uh, is, is telling me about a cell. But it turns out that that's fine. Given that the fundamental primitive that we care about in the map is similarity, and we have a data abundance, we're willing to decode these vectors by saying what other perturbations they're similar to, we don't actually need to explain what each individual feature dimension, uh, what each individual feature dimension means. And it turns out that even the original interpretable data modality, transcriptomics, is moving in this direction as well. Tools like single cell variational inference actually apply these kinds of deep learning driven opaque features to building maps uh, in transcriptomic data as well. So to close out, what I'd like to do is share a few words about what recursion is doing to enable ML research in phenomics uh, and to share some resources with the audience um, to, to, to get started in the field. About a month ago, we released a data set called RxRx3. Uh, it contains images, metadata, and deep learning embeddings of the knockouts of about 17,000 genes and multiple concentrations, typically six to eight concentrations, of about 1,700 mostly clinical stage compounds. We believe it's the largest publicly released data set of perturbative cellular imaging, and critically, it's all been generated at a single site with a consistent protocol. It's about a 100 terabyte data set uh, in total. Uh, and we think that this has a, a huge amount of potential to drive advances in machine learning technology, as historically, these, uh, the availability of data has then driven new advances um, in ML. In addition to, to RxRx3, we released a tool called MoleRec, which I think of as a keyhole view into recursion's maps of biology. What it shows off are plots of the kind that I showed at the beginning of the, uh, the, the deck. The ability to relate small molecules to one another and to gene knockouts with the whole suite of analyses that you might want in driving a drug discovery program. Whether you're talking about cytotoxicity, on and off target similarity, compound similarity, and, and dose response. Uh, 
Now, the one catch here is that these data sets are partially blinded. Um, you know, we are, uh, we are a, a commercial company and there are some pieces of data that, that, that we do want to, to hold back for ourselves. But we think that there is an enormous amount of work and an enormous number of advances that can come out of, of these particular data. And we do expect to unblind more of these over time. Um, of course, you know, if you'd like to add this to card and you'd like to unblind them all, uh, you know, come talk to me at the, at the end of the meeting. For only a small additional fee, I will personally hand deliver the hard drives uh, to, 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 to your offices. So, you know, uh, in order to, in, in, in conclusion, you know, the, a key application for, for AI and ML and a well-defined objective is to take unstructured data and unstructured data from, from assays at scale and turn those into structured data in order to be able to build maps. The things that I'd like you to take away are that standardized cellular imaging is super data rich and scalable, but not intrinsically computable. Given sufficient data, deep learning will take that and turn it into biologically meaningful representations that we think may be the next great omics technology for, for building these maps. Uh, and that you should go to rxrx3.rxrx.ai uh, and check out MOLREC as well as rxrx3 in order to, to advance your own deep learning research. Uh, some contact information is there at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and thanks for having me.